All right, so Proverbs chapter 16, just for, especially for those that, that haven't been here following with our Proverbs series, what I've been doing, uh, because we have a lot of different topics that are going over in the book of Proverbs, is I kind of got verses all over the place that deal with the same topic. So we're going to be going through somewhat topically through this. So we're kind of be jumping around and looking at a lot of different verses as we're going through chapter 16 here. And you'll also notice that there is a lot of repetition if you have been following along with previous verses or previous chapters on similar concepts. And that's because they are important concepts for attaining and gaining wisdom. You know, the beginning of the book of Proverbs explains that these are the Proverbs of Solomon and it's to, to give subtlety to the simple. It's to, it's to give us wisdom, to give us knowledge, to give us understanding, to help us just to grow and not to be stupid, not to be simple, but to be smart. God wants us to have wisdom. And this, all of these, these Proverbs will help you in your life to live a much better life, to make the right choices, and, and to avoid making foolish decisions. So let's jump right in here with verse number one. The Bible reads, The preparations of the heart in man, and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Now I want to tie this in. Look at verse number nine also. The Bible reads, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. And then in verse number 23, jump down to verse 23, the Bible reads, The heart of the wise teacheth his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. So the, the, the theme here in these three verses is talking about the heart of man. And it says that the preparations in the heart of man and the answer of the tongue, because, you know, out of the, the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if your heart is right, if your heart is set on the right things, then your mouth is going to be following suit. You're going to be speaking of the right things also. And the Bible says that that's from the Lord when, when you have a right heart and the preparations. You need to prepare your heart, though. It, it's not something that's just going to come just because you're saved, right? You can't just stop at salvation and just think, oh, well, my heart's just right. There are preparations involved. You need to set your heart aright. The Bible says a man's heart deviseth his way. You devise your own way based on your heart, but the Lord directeth his steps. The Lord directs and lines up the steps that you need to be taken, which is why we study the Bible so much, because he gives us the instruction. And he, his word is a light to our, foot, to our, to our path of saying, here's the direction that you need to take. Now, our heart will determine if we're going to follow that way or not. Our heart's going to say, well, which way am I going to take? God's saying, hey, I've lit up the path. This is the way you need to go. But in your heart's going to say, am I going to choose that way or not? And we need to make sure that we are keeping our heart. The Bible says the heart of the wise teacheth his mouth. We need to um, get our hearts right first so that our heart then can teach our mouth and addeth learning to his lips. Now, this is different from, flip over to chapter 18 in Proverbs, verse number 2. There's work involved in getting your heart right. Proverbs 18, 2 says, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. And this is the common theme. You, know, you hear this out in the world, the wisdom saying, Oh, you just need to go out and find yourself. You just need to just find whatever it is that, that you want to do and, that, you know, and just kind of let your heart discover itself. The Bible calls that foolishness. Amen. You can't just let your, your heart dictate whatever it is that you want to do. You can't trust your own heart unless you've set your heart right. And the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the Bible reads, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. The natural man, our, our, our natural heart, the natural man has a wicked heart. I mean, that's, that's what, you know, one of the main reasons why we're driven to sin. We have this fleshly heart. We need to change that, though. Once you get saved, once you're born again, you need to determine, hey, look, this is what the Bible says. God's path is lit up. I'm going to choose. I'm going to set my heart aright to follow the Lord and to do what's right instead of just letting my heart just, just kind of wander, right, and, and just discover itself. That's a foolish way of thinking. We need to look for God's instruction to direct our steps. And once you get your heart right, you know, once you set it on the right things, then your heart can lead you in the right ways. Then you can be um, more apt to be able to follow it with the, with the guidance from God's word. Let's look at verse number two here now in Proverbs 16. Verse number two, all the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. And this kind of goes real hand in hand almost with, with your heart, you know, not whether it's right or not. You know, everyone, when you do things, you generally do them thinking that what you're doing is right. 
I mean, nobody is going to just go out and do things, well, I don't want to say nobody, but, <laughs> and just know, yeah, this is wrong. You, you find a way to justify yourself, right? Even when, when, you, when people get into sin, it's, there's always a way for you to make it think, well, what I did was right. A great example, and I brought him up many times, is, is King Saul, when he didn't obey the word of the Lord. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. He didn't kill, like, they were, they were supposed to go out and, and just and wipe everybody out, kill all the animals, kill all the people, you know, just completely decimate the, the, the people that they were battling against, and he didn't do that. And they brought back the king, and they brought back the best of the sheep and of the, and of the goats and, and of the animals. And when Samuel confronted him, he's like, why didn't you keep the, God's word? Why didn't you do what you're told to do? He's like, I did do what God told me to do. And he had this real proud attitude. And what he did in his own eyes was right. Even though it was blatantly false and just completely wrong, in his own eyes, he thought he was doing what was right. He didn't think it was that bad. He's like, oh, well, no, we're going we're gonna to offer up these animals unto the Lord. See, that's a good thing. And instead of saying, well, you just didn't obey God. I mean, you just didn't do what he said. And that right there is wicked and wrong. And that's why it says, you know, we all think that we're doing the right thing, but God weighs the spirits. God knows the truth. God knows the score. And we ought not to deceive ourselves. And that's one of the hardest things to do sometimes, especially when you get into sin, is to avoid deceiving yourself from thinking that you're, do, you're, you're okay, that what you're doing is right. You constantly need to be going back over with a humble heart and, and checking your own life to make sure Am I doing what's right? Does it line up with God? What if God were to judge me right now? Would, would I be coming out okay or not? Um, as opposed to just thinking about it through your own eyes. Look at verse number 25. Proverbs 16, verse 25. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. See, there's some things that people could do like, oh, this seems like the right thing to do. And that's what a lot of people do is they follow, in, in that regard, their heart that hasn't been prepared. Oh, this seems like it's the right choice. In the end, they're of destruction. It's not wise. That's why we're going through the book of Proverbs, so we could gain that wisdom, so that the way that seems right is the right way. It's not just something that we have a feeling about, oh, well, this seems right. No, it's actually we could point to Scripture and say, this is the right way, because thus saith the Lord, because it's found in God's Word. The Bible says in verse number 3 here, look at Proverbs 16, 3, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. This is a real powerful verse, and this can help you out a lot in your life. Especially if you have a problem in your thought life. This is something that you, you may never know when, some, you know when someone else has this problem. You know when you have it for yourself. But you can have the best Christian outwardly. You know, someone in church that's just the best Christian, but inwardly they've got a really, really wicked, bad thought life. And, you know, if that's you today, and, and I'm sure we all have foolish thoughts. The Bible says even the thought of foolishness is sin. We all have this problem that we have to battle with. You know, uh, guys have to battle with this when there's, when there's scantily clad women walking around, when there's other things going on. You've got to make sure that you're not lusting after other women and committing adultery in your heart. There's all kinds of things that we need to be able to prevent ourselves from thinking wicked thoughts. But the Bible says here, hey, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. So if you have this problem with a bad thought life, you need to start committing your works unto the Lord. You can cleanse that mind by doing the right thing. Keeping yourself busy for one. Commit your works to the Lord. Say, I'm going to start doing this. Because here, I mean, the, pro the way that most people get into problem ever is having idle time. Time where there's nothing that you have set to do. When you have time to just kind of sit around and do nothing, that's the worst time to have. You need to make sure you are keeping yourself busy in one way or another, keeping, uh, doing something righteously. Not, I mean, not another being a wicked way, right? Doing something that's right. Committing your works unto the Lord. Doing what's right. And your thoughts will be established. The Bible says in Galatians 5, when it talks about the, the, the fruits of the Spirit itself and um, you know, the, 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 the lust of the flesh versus the walking in the Spirit, it says in verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the way to keep yourself from sinning is by doing what's right. I mean, it sounds pretty stupid simple, but think about that. If you want to make sure you're not fulfilling the lust of your flesh, then do what's right. 
You know, it's, it's, it's a lot harder to fall into sin when you're out knocking on doors and going soul winning. I mean, it really is. You're walking in the Spirit, you're going out with the Bible, and you're focused on winning someone to Christ. You're not going to be thinking about the ways of the world. You're not going to be thinking about any of the things that are going to cause you problems and then cause you to get into sin. When you're reading your Bible, it's a lot harder for you to be thinking about other, you know, your thoughts just to wander off. I know it happens from time to time, but when you're focused on this, when you're praying for other people, you know, when you're doing these things and these works and committing them unto the Lord and walking in the Spirit, you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's that simple. Now, the problem is filling all of our time with doing the things un unto God. I mean, that's, that's where the hard part comes in because we do have to do some things. We do have to go to work. We do have to do some things where it's not just completely under the Lord. But if you can try to, to work in any way to commit your works unto the Lord while you're at work, if you have the type of job where you could do some Bible memory while you're working, not everyone can do that. I mean, me, I'm, I'm a computer programmer. I can't just be focused on memorizing while I'm trying to write code. It just doesn't work. I'm not able to, to, to separate my brain that much to do that. But some people, you have a little bit more maybe of a manual labor type of job where it's not requiring as much thought or you do a lot of driving or you do something like that. Hey, work this into it. Try not to get that downtime. And now if you're working a job and you need to keep your, your mind focused on it anyways, you're probably not going to be getting off into, into bad thoughts and, and bad sins anyways. But it's important if you want to make sure that you get as much sin out of your life as possible, be walking in the Spirit. Doing that which is right. It's only going to help you. Look at verse number 4 here in Proverbs 16. The Bible says, The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. We need to remember this and keep this in mind. It'll help keep us humble. We think about God. When God made everything, he made it for himself. God is a God that wanted, you know, he gets joy, he gets satisfaction out of his creation, out of what he made. And he made all things for him. It says, even the wicked for the day of evil. You know, there is a satisfaction that is going to happen when the wicked are judged. God is going to have satisfaction at that because he did everything that he could to give us the opportunity and he loved us enough to say, here, salvation's free. I want you to have it and I'm going to do what I can to make sure that you can hear about it, you can know about it, you can receive it. It's there. It's open. Just receive it and take it. But when people refuse and when people don't want anything to do with it and people, you know, there's going to be a judgment for that. And it's still going to be to the glory of God the Father. The Bible says in Revelation 4, verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. We were created. God's creation is here for God's pleasure. Keep that in mind as you live your life. You're not, you weren't created just for you. Just to think about yourself and to live the most comfortable life that you can now and, and to, to experience the most you know, physical pleasure that you can in this world and have it be all about you. It's actually all about God. And if you want God's blessing in your life, you're going to remember that and, and please Him the most to get the blessings upon yourself. Let's uh, look at the next verse here in Proverbs 16. There's a lot of topics. There's, there's not as many, you know, in the past we've had some like maybe three or four main topics. This one's kind of got quite a few, so I'm going to try to get through these as quick as possible. Verse number five here, Proverbs 16, the Bible reads, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord, though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Now, hopefully you can see too, though, even though these are seemingly separate thoughts, how they kind of mix together. And, and as we're going from one to the other, you know, we just went from verse number four, talking about how all things are made for God, to verse number five, talking about the, who, those that are proud in heart, right? Those that lift themselves up. We're going straight from the attitude of, of we need to remember and be humble because God created everything for himself. Therefore, when he sees the proud in heart, those that lift themselves up, it says that's an abomination to the Lord. He hates seeing that. It says, though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. God will make sure that the, the proud is brought down low. Right. And Christian, you make sure that you have your pride in check. This is, this is a battle with the flesh. And men and women are guilty of the same thing. 
There are times when people step on your toes. There's times when people are going to say things to you. They're going to disrespect you. They're going to, you know, they treat you wrong. And the first reaction might be your pride taking over. And say, How dare they do that to me? Do they know who I am? You can't talk to me like that. That's your pride getting built up. Right. Now, you remember when, when King David was, was leaving, when Absalom kind of took over? And, uh, and he was just getting railed on. And you know, his men were like, are you going to let this happen? He says, yep. You know, he says, that might be from the Lord. He's like, just, just let him do it. And he had the humility to allow, um, what was it? Was it Barzillai? I forget the, the guy's name that was, that was doing that. It started with a B. But anyways, I think Barzillai was a different guy. But uh, he was railing on him. And David just said, Shimei? Yeah, so it's Shimei. I think you're right. So Shimei is over there, and he's just casting all stuff, and he picks up rocks. He starts like throwing them at David and stuff. And um, obviously, he's already down. He's already, you know, fleeing from Absalom and, and losing the kingdom. And this guy's adding uh, insult to injury, doing all this. But he said, you know what? Just, just let it be. You let him do it. And we need to have a similar type of attitude when when people come at us to not just be. Um, you know, quick to, to fight back, quick to just lift up our, be lifted up in our pride and say, they're not going to do that to me. Right. We need to be able to take a step back and say, fine. And we need to be able to overcome evil with good. Amen. And be able, and honestly, there's a lot of people that you might actually end up being able to win over. There might be a lot of unsaved people that are expecting you to fight back. I mean, a lot of times people know, hey, if I do this to that person, if I disrespect them, if I call them this name, they're going to come back at me. And some people actually like the fight. They like the confrontation. And they think that they're better than everyone else. They're already lifted up in pride. But when they come across someone and they see a humbled attitude, it's not what they expected at all. That might throw them for a loop and be like, whoa. What, what is this guy talking about? And then maybe be able to open up the door, you know, to get them saved or preach the gospel to them. We need to make sure that our pride is in check. And besides, God says a proud heart is abomination to him. Look at verse number 18 in Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction and in haughty spirit before a fall. Right. If you have a proud heart, he says only a matter of time and you're going to be destroyed. God's going to bring you low. God's going to abase you, and he's going to bring you down and, and make sure that you do not have a proud attitude. And we were talking about this on the way in from soul winning, how, um, how torturous and tormenting hell is. And you think about all the people that are unsaved. And the vast majority of those people end up not getting saved because of their pride. Because they don't want to rely on God for salvation. They don't want to receive the free gift. So many people want to work for it themselves and earn it. And unfortunately, because they're not able to receive the kingdom of God as a little child, they're not able to just put a childlike faith in Jesus Christ and just rely on Him and trust Him and say, God, I can't do this. I need you to save me. They can't do it. Because they say, nope, that's too easy. This easy believism, so that's too easy. I got to do something for it. That's a proud heart speaking. Right. Saying, I got to do it. I got to earn it. I got to work for it. Amen. And you know what's going to happen? They could be proud until the day that they die, but one day they're going to be burning in hell. Right. They're going to be burning and tortured and tormenting, and they're going to be thinking, what in the world did I do to be here? I thought, you know, like, I was a good person. I did this. And they're going to have a lot of time burning, at least a thousand years, at least during that millennial reign of Christ. Most people, a lot more than that, thinking, what in the world did I do? And going over everything in their, in their mind of what happened. Where did they go wrong? And what's going to happen, and the Bible records this, is that at Judgment Day then, at the great white throne judgment, when, when hell gives up the dead that are in them, and they're standing before the throne of God, every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. They will be humble at that point. No matter how proud they were in this life, then I'll never, oh, I don't, I'm not going to serve that God. That God could, you know, whatever, and, and, and curse God out and say all these proud, blasphemous, other ungodly, hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Right? Yeah, the memory passage. Robert knows what I'm talking about. He memorized you. <laughs> 
But the, uh, you know, these people that, that, that are proud in their heart, they're going to be humbled one day. They're going to be brought down low. And that is the ultimate destruction. Now, obviously, I'm preaching today to save people. Who, we don't have to worry about that destruction. But God is still not just talking about that with our pride. He, he wants us to remain humble. He wants us to be able to um, esteem others better than ourselves. We need to be able to focus on helping other people, which was the attitude that Jesus Christ had, where he was here to be a servant and to serve other people, not to be served. And that's the attitude that we need to have because the proud, the proud person isn't going to serve anybody. They're going to think they're better than that. They're going to think they're better than everybody else. But the Bible says that pride goeth before destruction and in haughty spirit before a fall. Look at verse number 19. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. It's a lot better than, you know, you could go ahead and, and, and get, divide the spoil, meaning, you know, getting these physical goods and these riches and stuff with the proud. Yeah, you could go and do that. But he says way better just to be humble. To not have as much with the lowly. It's way better to be with the lowly. And see, that's why when we go out sowing, we go out everywhere. We talk to everybody. We are not above, and at least that's the way it better be. That's the way it is right now, and that's the way it's going to stay. There's not going to be someone to say, oh, yeah, but they, they're homeless and they smell, and I don't want to talk to that person and, you know, and, and whatever. No, we're going to preach the gospel to every creature. We're going to go out there, and it doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter you know, how, how well they smell or, or if they're living in a box on the side of the road. Hey, all the more reason to give them the gospel. Amen. They're already down and out and everything else. We're dead sure. We're not better than them. We're going to go out and, and preach the gospel to them also because they need it just as much as anybody else does. Look at verse number 6 here. We'll go back to Proverbs chapter 6. Or, I mean, excuse me, Proverbs 16, verse number 6. Proverbs 16, verse number 6. The Bible reads, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Verse 7, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. And, and you think about how true this was w with King David. He, uh, he, was a, he was a man that was involved in a lot of fighting and wars, but he was also a man whose ways please God. And as a result of that, he provided peace all the days of Solomon. He said, it was, and it was because David lived a righteous life. He was, it was the result of his action because he walked in a way that was pleasing unto God. One, God fought all his battles for him. Anytime David was faced with adversity and he trusted in God, God made sure it was taken care of every single time. Going all the way back to Goliath. When David would face the Philistine, the great giant Goliath, he trusted in God. God delivered him into his hand. And, and every other time after that, when he was right with God, God was always there to get him through. And as a result of his ways pleasing the Lord, God made even his enemies to be at peace with him. And think about that. It's important for your life. Maybe, maybe you have a lot of enemies in your life. And maybe you feel like, you know, I don't know what to do about this. Well, make sure that your heart is right and that your ways are pleasing to God. Analyze your own life and say, am I pleasing God? Now, we know that, that you're never going to be like, like floating through life on a cloud with no problems ever arising. Okay? There are going to be times of persecution. There are going to be times when bad things will happen to us. But God is capable, when you're pleasing the Lord, to make even your enemies be at peace with you. He can provide that peace if you're doing what's right. So keep that in mind. Look at verse number 8 here. Proverbs 16, verse number 8. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Keep that in mind when you're doing your business, when you're dealing with people, when you're you know, conducting transactions, when you're selling things, whatever it is. It's easy to get caught up in the trap of greed. And to thinking, well, if I just do this, it might be a little bit dishonest. It might be, I might be tricking some people here, but I can make so much more money. Better is a little with righteousness, with what you're doing is right. When you have integrity and you say, you know what, I might not make a lot of money, but at least I'm being honest. I mean, there's times where uh, I remember before we, we moved up here when we, were, we, we had received a vehicle as a gift. It was like this real old suburban, like a 1970-something. It was a really cool car, but I just wasn't able to invest all the time into it or whatever. So it was a nice gift, and it was nice because we could still convert it into some cash or get some money for it. And we kind of did this little game where 
we, we traded that for this other vehicle on Craigslist. And I'm like, well, I think I might be able to use this a little bit more and then maybe sell this one for more money and you know, kind of doing this game. And it turned out that, that the car that we got had some other problems and I found out about it. So I had two choices. I could try to deceive people and try to get as much money as I thought I was gonna be able to get for that vehicle, right? And still make a profit and still make $1,000 or whatever it is that, that I thought that I was able to do with it. Or I could do what's right and take a lot less money and not pass that head, you know, and at least give the full disclosure, which obviously that's what I did. But this is the type of thing that we need to be able to do. We need to be able to have that integrity to not just pull an over on people to make a quick buck. Because ultimately, in the end, God's going to make sure that it evens out. Amen. When you do wrong to other people, be sure your sin will find you out. You know, you reap what you sow. And when you sow to the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. So whatever it is that you think you're going to make in that short term and say, well, I just won't tell them about this. I'm going to be a little dishonest about this. You don't want that coming back to you, you know, tenfold what you did to them. Because God is easily capable of making those things come back on you. And it's completely unwise to do that. You need to be content with where you're at, content with what you have. If you suffer a loss, then allow yourself to suffer a loss. And just chalk it up and say, well, I made a bad decision, I made a bad choice, or whatever. And if someone swindles you, as was the case in, in my situation, they, you know, they were dishonest with me, you know what? God will take care of that. It's, I mean, they'll, they'll end up getting what's coming to them. I don't need to make it right. Judgment belongs unto God. I'm, I'm going to rely on His righteousness and His vengeance, and that's fine. You know, He could take care of that. And you know what? When He and, and I believe this happened. I can't pinpoint to to exactly what happened, but I'm sure He blessed me for doing the right thing, even though I didn't get very much in that particular transaction. This is what we need to remember and keep this in mind. Better is a little with righteousness. Doing it the right way. Doing it God's way. It's way better to have just a little than great revenues without being right. Look at verse number 10. Now we're going to go through a whole list of, of verses here, verses 10 through 15. All these verses are basically talking about a king or a ruler of the people. Now, you may have heard this before. You may not have. There's, there's a lot of complaints about, well, not complaints, but arguments against the King James Bible. You know, we're King James only Bible church. We believe that this is the preserved word of God. And one of the attacks that people will make against the King James Bible is they'll say, oh, well, it's flawed because King James wanted this translation to be real friendly towards kings because he was the king. And he didn't want, there's these other Bibles that were translated different. And he didn't want, he wanted to still have like, instead of congregation, he wanted to have the word church in there, which congregation and church mean the same thing, by the way. A congregation is a church. So, but people will pick that apart and they'll say, see, look, he wanted church because he wanted the authority of the state church and he didn't want people thinking that a church is a congregation. You know, something stupid like that. Even though you could, you could easily prove from this translation that a church and a congregation are the same thing. You're not hiding anything from anybody. But this is one of the attacks that they'll make and they'll say, yeah, it's real friendly for, towards kings. But we're going to look at this. We're going to look at these Proverbs, which are, which are good Proverbs. And then we're going to go back, if you want to get a finger ready, in Deuteronomy 17, we're going to look in Deuteronomy, where God prescribes what he has um, in his law stated. There's some rules for a king to follow and what a godly king would look like. Now, let's, let's get started here, though, in Proverbs 16. Because, first of all, it's important to, re to recognize that it was never God's plan for a nation to have a king. That was not God's system of government of choice. His system of government was having judges where he was the king. God is the king and we listen, you know, and the people would listen to God's laws and there would be people to judge when matters arise and disputes and problems and people breaking the law to handle the, the judgment and the execution of the, the um, penalties of the law. That's God's perfect, perfect judgment, perfect law or perfect government. But he knew the wickedness of man. He knew that one day it was going to happen that these people are going to want a king. They're going to look at the nations about them. They're going to want someone else to protect them, someone else to do the work. Because honestly, having freedom, it requires individual responsibility. The more freedom you have, the more responsible you need to be. And a lot of people get lazy and they don't want to, to, to have to worry about taking care of themselves. They want someone else to take care of them. 
And the, the biggest fear that a lot of people had was, well, what about when someone invades us? Well, you know, we want someone to go out and fight for us. I want someone, some king, to just lead the way and do all the fighting for me. And that's at the time you know, when Samuel was basically the last judge. And the people said they wanted a king. Samuel warned them. He says, you don't want a king. Look, this is the way a king's going to be. He's going to tax you. He's going to take the best of your money, take the best of your fields, and, and you're going to pay tribute to him and everything else. You don't want a king. And they said, nope, we want a king. And God said, fine, give it to them. You know, they haven't rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me. And that's the way that all plays out. But just because it happened and it's not God's perfect will or perfect government, he still gave some rules and some laws. Say, okay, well, if you're going to have a king, then this is the way that it needs to be. As, as, a, as a, some guideline for them to do that, even though it's not what they should be doing. Look at, we're going to start off here, though, in Proverbs 16. Look at verse number 10. The Bible reads, A divine sentence is in the lips of the king. His mouth transgresseth not in judgment. And these, this is the way that a king should be, by the way. This isn't just the way that all kings are by default. These are Proverbs. If, if a king is a wise king, if he's a righteous king, then this is true for that, for that king. A divine sentence is in the, the lips of the king. His mouth transgresseth not in judgment. A just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are his work. Verse 12, it is an abomination to kings to commit wickedness, for the throne is established by righteousness. God's saying here, you know, the, the, if, if a king wants to just be established in his kingdom, then he needs to do right. He needs to do what's righteous because if they commit wickedness, God's going to remove them from. And you see that all, it's played out all throughout the first and second Samuel, all throughout the Kings, all throughout Chronicles. When someone is doing what's right, hey, they have their, their descendants going on. But then when they go into wickedness, God just cuts off all the house. Like they have, the whole house of Ahab was cut off. None of his descendants ended up being king then because of his wickedness. And it's happened in many other situations. And on the flip side, King David was the righteous king, right? And God probably says, you know what? There's not going to fail uh, one of his seed on the, on the throne in the kingdom. And God kept that promise because he did that which was right. Look at verse number 13. Righteous lips are the delight of kings, and they love him that speaketh right. The wrath of a king is as messengers of death, but a wise man will pacify it. In the light of the king's countenance is life, and his favor is as a cloud of the latter rain. Now, I know we don't have a king today. We have a different system of government. We have a president, but we have presidents today that seem to act like kings. Now, that's a whole nother story in and of itself that they're at, you know, that, that's wicked and it's wrong, but... Imagine how great it would be. Even though we don't have a king, if we just had a righteous person that was in the presidency, that could just speak with righteousness, I mean, how much rejoicing there would be. Now, I think, even though you know, everyone's not a Christian, not everyone believes the Bible, if we had a Bible-believing Christian in charge, the vast majority of people would just be like, this is great. You know, the people would rejoice when there's were someone doing righteousness, legitimate righteousness, and not doing lip service and doing right unto the people. And God would establish that person and establish that government, which I believe he did for a long time in this country when there was some relative uh, righteousness. And again, I know they're not perfect and people are going to be complaining about this after, you know, posting comments on YouTube or saying, oh, you don't know how wicked these people are, Illuminati, blah, 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 you know, all this stuff. But they were a reflection. The people in charge, even if the people in charge, even if every single one of them wasn't that good, they still were a reflection of the, of the people. I mean, they still were quoting Bible, you know, decades ago in their speeches. They still were talking about following the Lord and doing what, you know, and, and, and having law, some laws in place that reflected that as well. But look at Deuteronomy 17, because we're going to see here what, the, what God has outlined in his law for a king to be. And this makes sense when you start reading what a king is supposed to be, why those Proverbs read the way they do, why a divine sentence is in the, lip of a king, in the lips of a king, why righteous lips are the delight of kings. If they're going to be a king the way that God outlined in Deuteronomy 17, all those Proverbs make perfect sense. Look at verse number uh, 14 of Deuteronomy 17. Bible reads, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, 
I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. So the very first requirement is saying, you know what? You need to choose who God's choice is. That's who you're going to put over you. Now, I mean, today, if we apply this to today, like, God's choice is not running <laughs> in, in, in the, the main field. Now, he may be running somewhere. You just don't hear about him, right? I'm not saying he's not out there somewhere. God's choice probably is out there somewhere running. I just have never heard of him. People that are running right now is not God's choice. See, God says you need to first consider who my choice would be. Who is the best Christian? Who is, who is the, the person who fears the Lord the most and is what? That's who you want to be in charge to be king. Look at verse 16. And he also puts in the caveat there, and actually, you know, again, this is applied uh, to, to our form of government in a way. He says, Thou mayest not set a, a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. A stranger is a foreigner. Someone who is immigrated. You can't put an immigrant as the king. Why? Because they're not going to be as loyal to that people they might, they, it's a lot easier for them to have loyalties to their home, their home country, their home nation, and to be making uh, poor choices and poor judgments based on the fact that they're not from them. They're, they're a stranger, which is the exact same uh, laws that we have today in the Constitution for someone becoming president. You can't be a foreigner and be, you have to be um, a, you know, born here. You have to be born in the, in the states in order to, or under this jurisdiction, or whatever. Um, you can't be a foreigner and be a president here. And, and that came from uh, God's word here. Let's look at verse number uh, 16. It says, But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Now, multiplying horses, this is talking about building up the military, basically, because the horses were relied upon for, you know, chariots and, and having that strength and that might. He's saying you don't need to multiply the horses. And what they would commonly do is they'd go back to the world. Egypt was, it was symbolic of, of the world and of the world's ways and the world's wisdom and relying on flesh and, and, and relying on the wicked people, relying on Egypt to, to provide you with your strength because their strength needs to come from God. They can't be relying on the, the wicked nations about them. They needed to keep um, relying on the Lord. Look at verse 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart turn not away. This was written all the, this was all the way back in Deuteronomy. This is the law of Moses. God's word rings true all the time. And he says, look, don't multiply wives so your heart doesn't get turned away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. What happened with Solomon? He multiplied wives to himself. What happened? His heart turned away. He started serving other gods. He also had greatly multiplied to himself silver and gold. Now, God bless him, but he multiplied that. He was still sending ships out. And, and you notice when he sh sends the ships out and they bring gold back, the, the, the amount of gold that came back was 666 uh, talents or, uh, of gold. You know, it's the mark of the beast. It's the same number there that came back. He multiplied to himself silver and gold, and his heart was turned away. And, and these are the restrictions. God's saying, look, no, you need to have your heart right. You need to be able to, to make judgment. Don't get caught up in greed. Don't get caught up in, 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 these, in having many women. Look at verse 18. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom. And I love this. Well, this is the best. When he sits upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. He needs to make his own copy of the Bible, of God's law. The law of Moses. He needs to write it out by hand and have his own copy. Would to God we could have a ruler or somebody in this country that, that has handwritten their own Bible and say, yep. I mean, anytime you write, and you know, this is one of the techniques for memorization. I use this technique sometimes when I'm trying to memorize something. When you write something out, you're thinking about a lot, you end up memorizing it a lot easier. And this is what a king was required to do according to God's law. Say, you need to write your own copy. If a, if a king is required to write his own copy, guess what? He's not going to miss a word. 
He is going to be held accountable and responsible then. He can't say, well, I didn't know that. I didn't know that was part of God's law. Really? Because you were supposed to have written your own copy of it. Where's your copy? Well, you wrote it down here. How could you say you didn't know that? There's accountability for the king. And that way he does know all of God's law. He's at least had to have read it at least once when you make your own copy. Verse number 19 says, And it shall be with him. And he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom he and his children in the midst of Israel. Not only does he have to write his own book of the law, he's got to read it every day of his life. He says, you got to read there Every single day. And God, and God say, you know, he, God knows that a person being put into this position, which is why he didn't want a kingdom anyways, is that they're way too susceptible to getting lifted up, to getting proud, to thinking that they're better than everyone else. Why? Because they have all these servants. They have everybody serving them. They're in charge. What they say goes. That can go to your head really, really fast. And they're thinking that you are somebody special. I mean, in Egypt, the rulers there, they thought they were God men. I mean, and, and you could see how that could happen. I'm sure that didn't happen overnight. It happened with one strong ruler and then people, you know, looking at them and, and another ruler coming up and, and kind of getting into this position that's already been established and people giving you more and more reverence and more and more respect and, and, and you have all this power and you're gaining and amassing this power. They start thinking of themselves as God. They start lifting themselves up and God says, no, you know how you combat that? You read the Bible every day. You read my laws, you realize that I'm in charge and you're just my servant and you need to do righteously. And hey, if you're not reading your Bible every day right now, you ought to start doing it because that will help you to, to avoid the destruction that comes from being lifted up in pride. This is what God had prescribed. Turn, if you would, to Romans 13 real quick. Romans 13. This is what God has prescribed for a king to be like. Copying his own book of the law, reading out of it every day, not multiplying wives, not getting all rich, not getting all this amassing some huge army and some huge military. Think about all the power involved in all those things. Creating some huge standing army, creating you know, all this wealth and generating this wealth and having all these other people serving you, and, and all the power that goes along with that. It's not what God designed. Romans 13 will give us an example here. You say, oh, but that was just an Old Testament. Oh, that was all just, you know, for the children of Israel and all this and that. You hear the same thing. Well, Romans 13 provides a, a pretty similar um, mentality for the way the government should be run, even in the New Testament. I mean, it's, it's really not that much different. Obviously, God didn't want us to have kings. But he still said, if, if you're going to have rulers, I mean, this is the way that the ruler, the, the king ought to be. And... Uh, what he ought to follow. And these are good guidelines, even though we don't have a king for our rulers, our governors, the people who are in charge ought to be um, doing. And that's why when nobody out in the field is doing that, how can you choose who God wants to have in place? No one's doing it. I mean, those aren't the people that God wants. So, you know, you could, you could give me a hard time all you want for not going out and voting for, for some clown in this election, but I'm not going to do it because I'm not going to put cast my vote for someone who God doesn't want in charge. And that, I mean, it's easily, I could easily prove that all those people out right now, God doesn't want them in charge. If they don't love the Sodomites, they love abortion. Or both. And that's really, really, really bad. I mean, that's like, I'm not just, just nitpicking here. I, 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 how much worse can you get? I mean, it, those are like extremely bad wickedness to, to, to... No, I can't even hold my nose and vote for somebody like that. It's ridiculous. But look at the Romans 13. We'll go over this real quick. Romans 13, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. That doesn't say that all the governments that be are ordained of God, that God... You know, the, the communist China is ordained of God and all this stuff. No, it says the powers that be. God has ordained certain powers. God has ordained certain authority. There is an authority that God has given unto men. There is an authority that God has given to parents, to the father of the household. There is authority that God has given to a pastor in a church. There is authority that God has given to government and to rulers. 
in order to um, govern the people, in order for, for there to be laws and, and, and judgments uh, according to the laws done. Those are powers that are given by God. But it doesn't mean that every single government that exists is a godly government or that God has ordained for them to be like that. Look at verse number two. He's going to explain this. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Verse three. Four, rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. That is part of the power that God has ordained. That the rulers are not terror to good works. So if you're doing good works... It's outside of the ruler's power and authority then to punish you for that, to, to make a judgment against you for doing good works. It says, but to the evil. So when you're doing evil, when you're harming other people, when you're committing a crime against somebody else, that's why there's a ruler to punish the person who's committing the crime. He says, Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Verse 4, For he is the minister of God to thee for good. The minister of God. The, the, the governor, right, the ruler, is a minister of God. Now, that lines up with Deuteronomy 17, you know, in the way that God has ordained, in the, in the power structure that he has given, the power that he has said is from him. He views them as ministers of God to thee for good. Now, what, just because there's rulers that abuse their power and usurp authority that God hasn't given them doesn't mean that that's of God. There's a lot of, of people out there that will say that, I mean, it's almost disgusting how, how they're willing just to say, well, it's all of God. Oh, well, we got Obama because... You know, that's what God wanted, as if God just is putting these wicked people in place like, like it's a good thing, like that's what he wants. Right. No, I mean, the only reason God may have had a hand in them coming to power is just to judge us. Mm -hmm. Just as a, as a wicked judgment for the people, not because it's who, would, who is the right person to have in office at the time. And, you know, you get a lot of people say, oh, well, you just always, in the new versions, corrupt and pervert this passage so much into making you think that, like, you can never do anything against a government which is false. It's phony. I mean, because you, you apply that and say, oh, so then if you were in, you know, Nazi Germany and Adolf Hitler is doing his thing and, and, and you, know, all, you know, all this wickedness is going on, that you just can't do anything about it. No, that's, that's false. You can stand up and do what's right. You could overthrow government when its, uh, when it's not, authority is not coming from God, when they're not doing righteously. But let's keep reading here. Uh, we're almost done here in, verse, in chapter 13. Verse number five, wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath. Oh, wait, I, I didn't read verse four. Look at verse four. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So here we're seeing, that's why I bring this up real quick. In the New Testament, a justification for the government having the ability to, to perform a, a death penalty. Because it says here, he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. And before it says, he beareth not the sword in vain. You don't use the sword to do anything but to slay. That's putting someone to death. And people these days have this, this concept of, oh, you know, the death penalty has been done away with in the New Testament because when the woman taking adultery was brought to Jesus, you know, he didn't, he didn't kill her, he didn't stone her with stones. You know, he set her free, so, so there is no more death penalty in the New Testament. That's false. First of all, that story, they were trying to catch Jesus in his words. They're trying to get him in a lose-lose situation. They're trying to get him to say either, don't kill her, which is against the law of Moses, or kill her, which is usurping the, the authority of the Roman government, where the Roman government would then come in and say, you don't have the authority to do this, and then they would take Jesus away. That's what they were trying to do. Read the passage. It's really clear. But what did he say to her? Or to them, he says, hey, did he say don't so throw stones at her? He says, no, let him that is without sin and you cast the first stone. It's a very wise thing to say. He was able to get out of that situation without getting in trouble anywhere. It's a lot of wisdom. But he did not say not to stone her. That would have been something different. He said, hey, whoever's with sin, without sin among you, cast the first stone. Now, there's a lot to learn from that and everything else. But... Here we see very clearly in Romans 13, which is after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and not, not that any of it is contradictory, 
But it's very clearly established, hey, the government's there to be, a, you know, the ruler's there to be a minister of God and to execute wrath and judgment upon the evildoer, upon the person who does wrong. And the sword is not in vain, that, that they will execute judgment if they're being righteous. And that's the power that's ordained of God. God is ordained for a government to execute a death penalty when it's warranted according to his laws. Verse number five, wherefore you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Let's go back to Proverbs 16. We read all those verses about, about the king and you know, When you put it in context with Deuteronomy and with Romans 13 and, and, and God's establishment for that office, because usually when we think of kings, you just think of someone who's wicked and just, just a tyrant and everything else. It's kind of the first thought. So you're thinking like, what in the world is the Bible talking about here? But when you get in the proper context of the Bible of where, well, this is the way that God established it, and that's why the king's, you know, the, the sentence in the king's mouth you know, all the verses that we read there in, in uh, Proverbs 16, a divine sentence is in the lips of kings. Well, yeah, if he's reading the, out of the, the book of the law every day of his life and has copied his own, he ought to have a divine sentence. You know, he ought to have the wisdom. He ought to have the judgment. He ought to be righteous and he ought to keep himself humble. And therefore, you get these, these Proverbs talking about the king here in Proverbs 16. But let's move on here. We're almost done. Proverbs 16, verse 16. We're going to see some verses on the value of having wisdom. So it says, How much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather to, rather to be chosen than silver? The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He that keepeth his way preserveth his soul. I'm not going to go into this too much. We've gone into this a lot in the past. Just the, the whole value that God puts on wisdom. How it's way better than any riches you could get here. Just being wise and making the right decisions in your life will keep you from suffering and having a lot of um, just misery and sorrow when you can walk uprightly and get that wisdom. It's way better than any amount of money that you can possess. Look at verse number 20. Proverbs 16, 20. The Bible reads, He that handleth the matter wisely shall find good, and whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. This is going to bring you joy. Verse 21. The wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it, but the instruction of fools is folly. Jump down to verse 24. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. I believe we went over this uh, a couple weeks ago. We were talking about the, how, how speaking good words unto people can really go a long way. And it's, you know, here it's, it's health to your bones. You know, it's sweet as a honeycomb. It, it's, it, you can really do a lot of good for people. You know, as a church, we ought to be looking out for people. We ought to have kind words for others and, and edifying. And, you know, we don't, just, we don't just come here to hear the preaching. We don't just come here to sing songs. We come here to edify one another and to help each other out as, as Christians and, and, and care about each other and get to know each other and, um, and be able to help each other here as a church family, not just, as, you know, the church isn't Pastor Burzens. The church is all of us. It's everybody here. And we need to be able to remember that and honestly care for other people within this church and provide those pleasant words because there's a lot of people that can be going through some hard times and you might not even know about it. And by you speaking good words to them, it's, it's like health to their bones. Look at verse number 26. It says, He that laboreth, laboreth for himself, for his mouth craveth it of him. Verse 27 here, we're going to go into some verses here about the wicked and how they're always just causing problems and these are the people that you need to be staying away from. Verse number 27, an ungodly man diggeth up evil. Not only are they like pointing out when they, when they just come across it, they're digging it up. The ungodly man is going out there and just trying to dig up some dirt on somebody. Right? And that, that ought not to be you. Going out and trying to dig up dirt on somebody. Don't go out and find problems. Look, there's enough problems that we have to deal with in our life. The last thing you need to be doing is going out and digging up more. An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is as a burning fire, it's causing destruction, causing problems. Verse number 28, a froward man soweth strife. Not just strife with themselves, but they're going around, someone's froward, they're go out and, and, and start causing fights with everybody. It says, and a whisperer separateth 
chief friends, a whisperer, someone who's, who's gossiping, yep. someone who's spreading rumors. Right. People that watch out for those people. You know what? When you find someone like that, you give them a dirty look, the Bible says, uh, that, that your angry countenance is going gonna, is gonna to drive them away. You're going to stop that. When someone comes to you trying to whisper to you and say, oh, what about this person? Oh, did you hear this? And, and you're trying to come in between you and your friend. Don't have anything to do with that person. You mark them and avoid them and just say, you know what, no, you need, you, you're not going to talk that way about these people. You're not going to be a whisperer. and so Because that happens in a lot of churches and it actually causes a lot of problems and factions and, and, and all kinds of dis, disunity within the church when this type of whispering and backbiting is going on among people. And it needs to stop with you. You need to be able to, to be strong enough and bold enough to say no and not just go along with it, but be able to rebuke that person. And say, you're not going to talk this way because you're being a whisperer. You're being a backbiter. And confront them about it. Look, it's uncomfortable. But it's going to help the church a lot. Because you allow that to keep going and allow the, the, the seeds to be sown and sowing discord. It's going to grow and grow and get worse and worse. And someone needs to put a stop to it. Yep. I'm not always going to be aware of this. Usually the pastor is the last one to find out when that type of thing is going around. And I don't think we have that problem now, but an, an ounce of uh, prevention is, 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 is worth, you know... Pound of cure. Pound of cure, thank you. My mind went completely blank. <laughs> you get up here and try doing this for a while. <laughs> but that's why we're preaching, because we need to watch out for that. It is a problem that could creep into the church. Look at verse number 29. A violent man enticeth his neighbor and leadeth him into the way that is not good. He that shutteth his eyes to devise froward things, moving his lips, he bringeth evil to pass. There are wicked people out there, and we need to be aware of them. We need to watch out for them. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. You know, most people don't comprehend as well. It's, it's harder to understand that there are people who are bent on doing wickedness. There are people that are devising and planning to destroy and to do wickedly. You say, how could someone be like that? Because you're not like that. But the people exist, and we've been warned over and over and over again that they're out there, and you need to be aware of it. You need to be on guard. You need to be vigilant. And when you see the little things happening, you see the whisperings, you see the backbitings, you know, you, you see the, the man enticing his neighbor, the violent man, he's going to lead him in the way it's not good. Watch out for these types of people. Look at verse number 31. Proverbs 16, 31. We're almost done. We've got a couple verses left. The hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. A lot of people only get half of this verse because you know, we ought to respect our elders. We ought to respect people who are older. You know, it says the hoary head. Hoary means it's like white. The Bible refers to hoary frost. You think about frost on the ground, it's real white. The hoary head here is someone who's aged. Someone who's got white hair by virtue of their age. We live in a backward society. Kids are no longer respecting their elders. Kids are, you know, the people in general just have lost respect. Even adults aren't respecting people anymore and not having common manners and common courtesy and integrity and, and just, you know, living and doing what's right. It's just completely out the window these days and no one seems to have respect for anyone. The Bible says here, the hoary head is a crown of glory. If it be found in the way of righteousness. Now look, the hoary head isn't automatic. Just because you've made it to an old age, it's not automatically a crown of glory. If you've lived a wicked life your whole life, that's not a glorious crown for you. It's actually just a shame that you've done so much wickedness through your life. But if it's found in the way of righteousness, that is a crown of glory because it's hard to live the righteous life day in, day out, and to, to do that up until you're old and well-aged. That is a crown of glory, and we need to respect that. The Bible says in Leviticus 19, you don't have to turn there, Leviticus 19.32 says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God, I am the Lord. This is one of those customs you might think, well, why do people do that? When an older it's not even happening these days, but it ought to. It's in God's law. We as Christians, at least, ought to still be following this type of thing. It's not just polite. It's not just good manners. When old people walk into the room, maybe you have a family gathering or something, and you're, and you're with your, your siblings and with your family, and then grandpa walks in the room. 
You know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to stand up. If you're sitting down, having fun, playing a game, you know what you do? You stand up. And you give that man respect. That's what the Bible teaches. And that's the way things used to be as commonplace and taught in public schools. And it's out the window these days. But it's still written in the Bible. And we ought to observe and do this and honor the face of the old man and pay respect, man. If people have been around, you know, pay respect to the wisdom that they have, even if they're not like the most godly person and know the most Bible. When you've been around for a long time, you gain wisdom. If it's not the easy way, you gain it the hard way. Okay, one way or another, you're going to get some wisdom. And the older I get, the more I know that that's true. There's a lot of things I've learned the hard way. But there's also a lot of things I've learned the easy way, learning it by just getting it from God's word. And you need to be able to pay respect unto the people who are older and that have the, the hoary head. Uh, the last two verses, look at verse number 32, Proverbs 16, 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. And I know I've gone over this verse before, but we need to, to keep control of our temper, be able to be in charge and be in control. And it's better to have that control than to be really strong and real fit and able to just kick anybody's butt. If you're just like real buff and real strong, but you're always just angry and stuff, you might win some fights, but ultimately you're going to be losing anyways. It's way better not to get in that fight. It's way better to be humble. It's way better to be able to control your mouth and be slow to anger and not just let yourself fly off the handle and get in fights with everybody every, every time someone steps on your toe. It says, He that ruleth his spirit is better than he that taketh the city. And then verse 33, The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all these words of wisdom that we have. There's a lot of subjects that we covered, dear God. I pray that you please help us all to remember them, to keep them as we leave tonight, dear Lord, not just to forget about the sermon, especially as we go out and have some good fellowship together as a church um, over dinner, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just help us to be mindful of your words, to apply them in our, in our lives. Uh, were appropriate, dear God, especially where we're lacking. Lord, help us to commit our works unto you that our thoughts may be established, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.